Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today. My name is Jen Monet and I work on the integrated pest management team at the San Francisco Department of the Environment. Um, I'm going to be your MC today. So uh, for starters, if whether or not you've uh, filled in this poll, um, feel free to put in your name, your title, uh, the company or organization you work with in the chat box uh, to get to know each other. I think this would be a nice way to start, um, start the event. Uh, throughout, we'll also be posting useful links in the chat and we'll be answering questions at the end. So feel free to put any questions you have uh, throughout the presentations um, in the chat or hold on to them for later. At the end, we'll have plenty of time for Q&A. Um, so let me, so as you see, we'll start off with a, a, um, a friendly welcome for our, from our partners at Rescape California. Then we will um, have an introduction, sorry, that's Teresa Martinez. Then we'll have um, an introduction to the pest prevention guidelines before hearing from two presenters on different stories about um, pest prevention by design before launching into our Q&A. I'd like to thank the presenters who will be speaking to us today. Um, I'd also really like to extend our appreciation to Rescape for hosting and organizing this event. And we'd like to thank SF Public Utilities Commission um, who are a huge partner, very important partner in getting uh, these, develop these guidelines off the ground. Without further ado, to welcome to this web, web event and introduce our organization, we have Teresa Martinez, the program manager for Rescape California, formerly known as the Bay Friendly Landscaping and Gardening Coalition, which has been an important collaborator in getting this thing going. Teresa, welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Jen. I'm just going to um, share the results so we can see who's on the call today. So it looks like we have landscape designers, pest control specialists. Um, Donna is saying that she's a, a purchasing manager and it looks like we're about evenly split. This is pretty great between residential, commercial, HOA, park and restoration site work. So welcome everyone. And I think I saw that we have um, somebody here as um, far away as Pennsylvania. So that's super exciting. Thank you. Um, I think the other thing we just wanted, the other housekeeping issue to um, talk about really quickly is please feel free to use your chat. We're hoping that if you um, see somebody or you hear something from somebody else and you'd like to learn more from them or to connect with them, to please um, you know, feel free to interact with each other in the chat. And then we thought we would hold questions um, about, um, all of the presentations for the Q and A session, um, except I think if you have something really pertinent, you know, go ahead and put it in the chat, and we'll try to address it. So, welcome. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, Rescape. Um, Jen, can I share my um, yes screen? Okay, yes, yeah, absolutely. Um. So just give me a minute. Um, so like Jen mentioned, uh, my name is Teresa Martinez and I am from Rescape, California. We are a nonprofit that ev advocates for a regenerative whole systems approach to landscaping education workforce development and advocacy. And we address earthscape climate change issues. Teresa, um, I'm, yes. I'm so sorry to interrupt. I don't actually see your slides. I don't know don't, if anyone okay. else can. Sorry about that. Here we go. How's that? That's great. Okay. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, so we were formally known for about 15 years as Bay Friendly Landscaping and Gardening Coalition. So those of you who are in the San Francisco Bay Area, Northern California, probably remember a lot of us known as Bay Friendly. And Bay Friendly can be a proper noun, a noun, an adjective, and a verb. And so you will see that we have policy in our name called Bay Friendly policy. We also have a philosophy sort of known as um, 
bay friendly landscaping. So you'll see our name um, throughout. And as we grew um, to expand more in California and now in other parts of the country, we are known as Rescape. So if you see bay friendly, um, think Rescape. Um, we uh, take a whole systems integrated approach to regenerative landscaping, which means that we really look at assessing the entire landscape for current and needed or required elements in order to design, construction, maintain the landscape to not only save resources like energy, water, and money, but also to enhance the function um, and the sustainability of this site while also being you know, completely gorgeous. We focus, um, in our organization on landscape community education, job training, and landscape policy. And we hit those three things by educating communities with hands-on workshops um, and web sometimes webinars like we're doing today and probably will be in webinar online format for at least six more months. You know, we'll see how it unfolds here in California. We train landscape professionals in our eight principles for regenerative landscapes, which I'm going to talk about next. We facilitate the adoption of landscape ordinances. So we have landscape ordinances in um, all cities in Alameda County, um, some policies in San Francisco. Um, we also are in general plans throughout the peninsula and in San Jose. We create partnerships to advocate for regenerative landscape practices, um, such as with the Department of Environment today. Um, we also support small uh, landscape businesses by connecting um, the professionals that we train with um, home gardeners or clients who might want to hire them. So we really want to create a space for people to do um, practice regenerative landscaping um, in their profession. Everything we do is based on our eight principles for regenerative landscaping um, to mitigate the impacts of climate change and empower and promote regenerative landscapes. And so we're hoping that people widely practice um, our principles and you know, we're able to mitigate the effects of climate change by acting local, reducing waste, nurturing, nurturing soil, sequestering carbon, saving water, conserving energy, protect water and air, and create habitat. And so we'll, all of those principles work individually on their own in the design, construction, and maintenance components of a landscape, but they also are much better all together. And we take our principles also into the way that we um, interact with each other um, in person and online and in the community. So it's not only something that we practice um, in our design, but also as an organization. Um, and we're hoping that some of the issues, if not all of the issues around pollution, water and energy waste, poor plant health, um, erosion, um, and higher maintenance costs, all are addressed by um, practicing our eight principles. And we do that in all of our programming. Um, with our training and qualification programs. We have uh, multi-day qualification programs um, for professional landscapers um, in the design um, and maintenance field. And then also we focus on firescaping, which is our newest qualification program. And then those small businesses, once they um, attend um, and receive a qualification um, through our training, they can be listed on the professional directory that I was just talking about so that they're able to get work um, and, and build the landscapes around us in our communities. We um, host advanced professional um, workshops. We um, work on legal compliance with landscaping um, policy like um, WELO. Um, the newest landscaping policy is going to be is around compost and mulch in um, SB 1346, or 1383, I'm sorry. And then there's 13, 
46, which possibly by 2025, uh, gas powered um, landscape equipment will be outlawed in California. Um, and we're also working towards college certification classes and providing educational resources. We have a ton on our website, so I'll make sure that I drop um, the website um, in the chat so you can learn more about what we're doing. Um, and the very best of what we do is reflected um, by practicing the eight principles in our rated landscape program. So we have over 95 rated landscapes with 15 more on the horizon in Northern California. That is a rating system for landscapes that uses a scorecard um, with our regenerative um, principles and 14 required practices based on those principles. Um, and they're mostly right now, we rate civic, institutional, commercial, and multifamily residential properties. We're doing the Presidio Tunnel Tops right now in San Francisco. Um, and usually it's for landscapes that are more than 2,500 square feet um, in the irrigated area. This is a very brief list of the ordinances and resolutions that I was talking about earlier, just so you can kind of see um, where we are in the policy world. And so we're super happy that you're here today. We couldn't be more honored to partner um, with the Department of Environment um, and be here. And we hope that today is the start of an um, ongoing relationship with Rescape where you can come to us with ideas and um, share best practices with each other. So we invite you to check us out, take a training, um, you know, send us a message, become involved um, in our movement because there really is um, power in numbers around um, regenerative landscape and um, mitigating the effects of climate change. Um, so with that, I will be here um, in the chat if anybody has anything they want to talk about today, and I'll drop some more um, resources in there. And I'm super excited because the um, pest prevention by design is perfectly aligned with everything that we're all about at Rescape. So thank you, Jen. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, everyone. And I'm um, looking forward to hearing more from our speakers and our attendees today. So thank you. And thank you so much, Teresa, for all the work that you've been doing, um, both with Rescape and also to help us put this event on. It really wouldn't have been nearly what it is without Rescape. So thank, thank you. you. Um, and now we have the stupendous Chris Geiger, who uh, manages <laughs> the Integrated Pest Management um, Program for the City of San Francisco. And he is one of the main co-authors of the Pest Prevention by Design Guide for Landscapes. So Chris, would you like to take us for a whirl and show us what this guide's all about? <laughs> sure. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. Thank you, Jen. And hello, everyone. I'm glad that uh, you all could make it this morning. Um, I'm going to um, uh, and also really in advance want to thank the uh, the many, many members of our working group, and you'll see a list of names flashing by uh, on the screen in a moment, but um, this was a, uh, a labor of love for them. And uh, some of them are actually on the, I see on the presentation in the audience right now. Thank, thank you to all of you. Um, so pest, pre pest prevention by design um, started out, well, let me just, go to the very general level of the, uh, the situations we are facing here, you may have noticed that we are not alone on this planet. There are some other organisms that we have to share the planet with. And um, sometimes we don't notice them, sometimes we do. Um, and sometimes, you know, there is, uh, well, we might feel surrounded. We are surrounded and some of those organisms are most of them, I should say, are quite amazing. I can't resist showing my favorite moth. It just looks like a stuffed toy, stuffy toy. Um, now, inevitably, when you are sharing a space, there's, there are going to be a co collisions and competition. Uh, our needs sometimes collide. And 
this is where pest management comes in. And this is one of the fascinating aspects of pest management. It's one of the reasons I got involved in it in the first place is because there's no other area um, where humans and other organisms compete more directly and where we have to manage that competition uh, than in pest management. So one of the things that we have taken a long time to learn as a species is that there are other tools besides just killing the, the offending organism. Uh, killing is not the only solution. Uh, in the bad old days, when especially when uh, organic pesticides were first invented, uh, that seemed to be a silver bullet and everyone was spraying everything and having the illusion of control over the ecosystem that they were trying to manage, we soon learned that that had some very big implications and some bad implications. And that what was required was a much more enlightened and actually information intensive approach to managing other organisms. And uh, pests, by the way, are not born as pests. <laughs> pests are just other creatures. They are pests by virtue of the fact that we don't want them there. That's the definition of a pest. So what's a weed in one situation might be a beneficial species or just a benign species in another. And when I talk about pests, I am talking about weeds as well. So one of the fundamental aspects of integrated pest management for those of you who are familiar with that term um, and is prevention. And prevention is, it requires a lot of knowledge about the ecosystem that you're working with, a lot of knowledge about the biology and ecology that you're dealing with. And uh, it is also really notable in the fact that it's not very glorious. <laughs> prevention is often some very run of the mill uh, actions that we can take like cleaning up this mess. That's a great way to prevent rats is to get rid of all this food or to make it impossible for them to reach this food. But with prevent prevention, it is pretty much impossible to measure your success because it's really impossible to measure things that never happened but might have happened. And so that is the, one of the difficult challenges with, with pest prevention. So um, years ago, the um, Integrated Pest Management Program for the city and county of San Francisco in our monthly meetings, which we've had for the past 20 years, 20 plus years, um, kept coming back to the subject of how poor the designs were that people were having to deal with, the landscape designs, the building designs, and how many of the problems that they experienced could be traced back to bad design, uh, whether it's just holes in the wall or unscreened uh, you know, utility breaks in, in walls of structures to irrigation that was configured inappropriately, uh, um, bad plant selection, lack of barriers, so forth. And we set out looking for some solution for that. And we did not find it. We found lots of bits of information scattered around uh, a lot of them in old military reports, for example, a um, uh, lot of old materials actually, but no one had put it all together in a package that was suitable for the people who really needed it. And that would be the landscape designers, landscape architects, property managers, and so forth. So we were very fortunate to get a Centers for Disease Control grant to pull together a national working group on the subject. And over the span of about two years, pull together what you see here, with this, which is called pest prevention by design uh, for structures. And I think there might be a couple of people on, on the, uh, uh, in the participants list here who were part of that. Um, that was a wonderful effort. And uh, actually a lot of, uh, it's been used quite a bit around the country, uh, including uh, in green building projects, LEED certified projects. It is uh, referred to in the reference materials for LEED, if you're familiar with that. So that was our first effort. That was 2013 when that came out. Um, and we were lucky to be able to put that into practice in affordable housing units here in San Francisco because the San Francisco Housing Authority was reconfigured and there was an opportunity to do a lot of renovation in those units 
So we installed uh, pest, prevent, pest preventive elements of various sorts in about 3,500 units of affordable housing in San Francisco. We are now in the process of evaluating uh, what kind of impacts that effort has had. But then there's what about landscapes? Of course, that was the, the question that kept <laughs> coming up. And when you think about it, uh, humanity is, um, uh, well, from the air, it looks a little bit like a fungus. And here's, here's a piece of Brazil and a piece of Brazil 20 years later, uh, you can see how we're spreading across the landscape and how much space we're occupying and how much impact on the ecosystem that likely has. The, the choices that are made in managing those landscapes can have a huge impact. And we wanted to pull together a similar effort on landscapes. This time we did not have the big grant to fall back on. Uh, so we decided to start this out as an in-house effort. Um, and still, we were extremely fortunate to have a whole long list of people, and I won't try to read through this, who uh, took this on as part of the work group. Uh, and uh, like I said, this was a labor of love. And um, uh, so we had meetings over a about a year and a half's time starting out with um, a world cafe session. If you've never experienced a world cafe meeting, it's a little bit like speed dating. There are a bunch of tables in a room and you <clears throat> change tables every 20 minutes and you're talking about a, a specified topic. It's a great way to generate ideas, to uh, take advantage of expertise in the room. And from that initial world cafe, we developed a great starting list of what I'll call tactics for inclusion in this latest iteration of the pest prevention by design guidelines. After that, <clears throat> we um, did a lot of literature review, uh, for both uh, in, uh, professional literature and scientific literature, assembled a database of all this stuff and put together our work group and had monthly meetings where we did a lot of discussion and review of whether these tactics belonged or did not belong in a set of guidelines, and um, which was not an easy decision in many cases. <clears throat> and we also had to categorize them in a way that was meaningful. And finally, it was all done, and we were all set to have our grand rollout in April of 2020. So a little thing happened back then uh, called COVID, and that is the reason we are having this um, rollout now in uh, uh, landscape, uh, uh, it's uh, Landscape Architecture Month, April. And uh, so it seemed fitting to do it now. It, it, we needed to do it and we had not done it yet. So um, that's where we are right now, but we have actually started publishing it many months ago on our website. So that, that's the kind of backdrop <clears throat> for the guidelines that I'm going to talk about here. A few caveats. This is landscape emphasis, so that's up to the edge of the buildings. Um, that was our boundary line. It's a design and retrofit emphasis, and this is surprisingly difficult because there are many things that are strictly maintenance, many tactics that are strictly maintenance <clears throat> that we had to make decisions on whether including or not. And we, we tried to draw that line with design and retrofit. So if you're doing a renovation of a landscape and this is something that would be useful for you, it, it was fair game for the guidelines. Um, these are also guidelines, not standards. We weren't making an attempt to legislate this because there is such a huge diversity of landscapes out there that that just is sort of ungainly. Uh, so it's a um, voluntary guidelines, <clears throat> excuse me. So I'm, right now I'm going to lead you through just the the, very quickly, the chapters that are in the guidelines just to give you an idea of the content. I can't possibly lead you through all the details, of course. <clears throat> I'm going to give you an example of, of each chapter. Chapter one is what something you might not expect to be in this sort of a publication, but it's about developing a maintenance plan. And so this is, this is a, the root of prevention is good planning. There are many, many things that can go into plans that will help you long into the future if, if the plan is followed. Um, the goals here were to include maintenance in administrative systems and budgets so that <clears throat> there were, would not be um, 
and so that it could be done efficiently and so that it would be done in a way that prevented infestations of various sorts, uh, including maintenance and sanitation infrastructure and physical designs. An example might be what you see here. If you are maintaining parks and you are moving equipment back and forth between parks, you might find yourself having a problem with transporting weeds, invasive weeds, uh, such as Arctotheca, for example, <clears throat> on the equipment. And so it's great to plan for a place where you can clean that equipment between uses and avoid a whole lot of expense and effort in the future in those other, those other parks. Chapter two is about soils and water, which is pretty fundamental to any, any uh, growing system. And here the goals were, as you might expect, using the site soil and water factors to inform plant selection. And this is much more important than many people give it credit, <clears throat> as well as managing soils to reduce pest problems. So here, an example here might be to make sure that you include proper drainage to uh, uh, prevent puddling in landscapes and mosquito infestations that might result from that. Chapter three, planting, planting design, by the way, this is a bay friendly graded landscape in the East Bay. Um, <clears throat> planting design is hugely important. The right plant in the right place is not, not a new idea. The goals here are designed with the whole area in mind. Um, prioritizing plant diversity, um, beware of introducing invasive plants and choosing pest resistant plants. And un underneath all of this really, there's a big move towards native plants when possible because this really does support uh, local ecosystems and <clears throat> um, biodiversity. So example here, selecting plants that are not favored by rats, such as ivy. Whenever I see ivy now, I'm permanently scarred by this effort uh, to put together guidelines because I see ivy, I see rats. Uh, that's an ideal habitat. It's also a food source and a water source <clears throat> for rats. So too much ivy is, is a bad idea. Chapter four is about physical barriers, which might, might be what you first think of when you think of preventing weeds. Um, and this is very important and there's a lot of tools out there to do this. Uh, the goals here you know, are to restrict the infestations and restrict the movement of those pests or weeds <clears throat> using various physical barriers. And also uh, there's a special attention to the use of mulch, which is a barrier itself, but it's the science to choose the right mulch for the right situation and the right, uh, whether it's fabric or, or organic mulches um, or stone mulches. An example of physical barriers, um, rat burrows in tree wells in cities are, a, are an issue in our city and in other cities. And there are some uh, devices or some materials out there that can prevent this. This is a, um, a, a wire mesh mat <clears throat> that encircles the tree and um, is buried beneath the mulch and provides a barrier to, um, to burrowing rats, for example. And let's see here, <clears throat> chapter five, sanitation. You wanna keep the bad organisms out of your site, especially if you're doing uh, remediation or mitigation projects uh, such as uh, uh, the Public Utilities Commission is doing on the peninsula and East Bay here in San Francisco. You wanna keep the weed seeds out, you wanna keep the diseases out and there are various ways to do that, like a <laughs> boot brush, which is pretty simple. Um, uh, we wanna keep, wanna make sure we're screening seeds and nursery stock before planting, minimizing refuse in landscapes. This is more for rodents and, and birds, preventing the import of new pests and diseases. So this is kind of a stupidly simple example, but um, <clears throat> making sure those dumpsters are secure from rodents to the greatest extent possible can have a big effect on rodent infestations in an area. <clears throat> so that's the rough outline of the guidelines. And we we're trying to find ways that we could reach the most people and make it as useful as possible. And we decided to have two options for the guidelines. 
One is there is a downloadable version that you can just print out, throw in the back seat of your car and take with you. <clears throat> and this has most, but not all of the content that you find in the other option, which I'll describe. So here's a sample page from the downloadable version of the, of the um, guidelines. You'll see it has items like applicability, design stage, pests affected, details of the um, recommendation. How does it affect the pests? <clears throat> and an important one is trade-offs with other design objectives. Sometimes, you know, uh, there might be a big, uh, a big cost impact, or maybe there's a big, uh, maybe it's something that's generally ugly if it's put in the wrong place. You want to keep that in mind, and that's why we included that in the, uh, in the guidelines. Uh, we have things categorized by landscape types where they would likely be appropriate. And we also have um, tools, and these are just sample tools that we found during the process of putting these together. They're not um, endorsed by the city and county of San Francisco, but for educational purposes, we include tool related tools. So that's the downloadable version. We also have, and this is what I would recommend, is to use the online database. <clears throat> Don't try to copy that link. We will put the links into the chat for all of these things. And we'll also send it out after the, um, after the presentation. So the online database, is actually the most convenient way to use this and we have various ways to use it and I give you I will give you a quick quick tour of what it looks like here is one view of the online version and notice there are three tabs there's one for tactics what we're calling tactics and these are sorted right now by chapter <clears throat> excuse me there is a tab that has the tools that I was talking about and those are all linked to the tactics and then we have a, a tab that is uh, for the references. So if you want to find out where, what our sources are, you can easily see that. Uh, within the tactics, and this is getting into the weeds, sorry, pardon the pun, pun a little bit, uh, there are different ways to look at it as well. So you'll notice in the upper left-hand corner, it says gallery, this is called a gallery view of it. <clears throat> if you click on that, there is another view that's organized in chapters. And that looks like this. You'll have um, chapters and it's, it's collapsible and you can see everything kind of in an Excel type format. But within these tactics, everything is linkable. So if there's a tool that's listed, you can click on it and find out more. If you, there are references um, you want to know more about, you can click on it. So. And I think one of the most important things here and, and, and a great reason to um, have this in a database format is we want to make sure that it's alive, a living document. We want this to not just stop where it is, but to be able to be grow to, I'm sorry, be able to grow, to be able to crowdsource other tactics that belong there or to get comments from people who are using this on what's appropriate and what's not. So we have a way to do that. That will also be provided in the links. It's a, a simple form that allows you to suggest other tactics or suggest comments or changes to existing ones. <clears throat> so that's what I've got for you. And um, we'd love to hear from uh, comments from the crowd uh, at the end of our session. We have plenty of time for Q&A. Um, and I think at this point, I will turn it back to Jen. Thank you, Chris, very much for taking us through the guide. Um, and now to illustrate some of the tactics that Chris went through, um, give you a sense of how these can be applied, uh, we have Deshilia Nikki Mixon. She is the IPM coordinator for the San Francisco Public Works Department. Um, she was a member of the working group for the guidelines and quickly set out to put them into practice in a very challenging and high profile location, UN Plaza. Uh, she's going to describe that big initiative and its implications. Thank you, Nikki, for being here. Thank you, thank you for having me. Give me a moment, let me uh, do the screen share. Okay. Okay, hold on. Hold on a second, sorry. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
And as Chris mentioned, um, we we are putting the links in the chat box to the to the guide, to the feedback form, um, and to a number of different things. So, just a reminder. Take it away, Nikki. Thank you. So I'm assuming. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Thank you. Thank you. So um, thank you for the introduction. Uh, like Jen said, my name is Nikki Mixon, and I'm the Senior Integrated Pest Management Specialist for Public Works. And what we do at Public Works is we maintain right-of-ways, staircases, unincorporated streets, easements, and plazas throughout San Francisco. And just again, as Jen said, the project that I am gonna be talking about is the project we did at UN Plaza. The project actually started off as an abatement project, but due to the high level of Norway rat activity, it ended up being a renovation project. So just to give a little history of uh, UN Plaza, uh, for those that don't know it, it is in the heart of downtown San Francisco and it is just east of City Hall. You can't see City Hall in the slide, but but it's it's just, it's there. Um, so uh, the area is, uh, has constant activity, uh, pedestrian activity 24 hours a day and it's under constant pressure. And at this time, uh, when the uh, Norway rats were uh, infiltrating the area, there was a lot of construction going on in the, in the area and there's still actually construction, but they were putting up um, 49 South Van Ness, another building across the street from that. And then as well, um, uh, Van Ness Street is being renovated at the time that, that um, we had the increase in population. But in the immediate area, some of the things that happen is that there's a farmer's market there a couple of days a week, there's festivals, there's different types of demonstrations, there's um, nighttime events, there's free food giveaway for um, the unhoused and um, from different organizations. And there's also um, a BART station in the area. Um, and one thing that was also happening in the area at the time is they had put up an art exhibit. So in this photo, you'll see um, you'll see the uh, platform, which was actually part of the um, exhibit. And this photo was taken during the daytime. So you can kind of get an idea about uh, the rodent population that was happening there. So, um, by the time I was getting emails about, about the increase of rodent activity, um, it was our, the population of the rodents was, was always, was already extremely high. So in order to start this project, because it was complicated, there's a lot of stakeholders in the area. You have MTA, you have public works, this exhibit, is maintained, the area is maintained by Public Works, but it's actually a uh, Wreck and Park property. Uh, and then we also had the Asian Art Museum who was in charge of, uh, of putting the exhibit up. And the reason why the exhibit was there was to create a more positive uh, energy in the space. So so we, we had a few meetings to try to figure out what are we gonna do so, of course, our, our first resort was we're going to do some night trapping. So we did night trapping for about a month, three days a week. And we did actually get the population down. But as soon as we stopped doing the night trapping, the population rose up again. Um, so what we did uh, second tier was we had cut some, uh, some holes actually in the platform as well. So we can uh, have access 24 hours, and it wouldn't create a, a safety issue as well. At the time, we're doing trapping, um, SF, uh, SFMTA and BART, they're also doing tunnel trapping at the same time. They're doing bait stations in the tunnels. Public Works, our uh, building repair team, they're um, doing cracks and crevice treatments. I mean, not treatment, sorry, ceiling to, so that the, so we had areas, as you'll see in the slides where rodents were living. Um, public health was out doing outreach and citations for local businesses where there were holes um, 
in the building as well, in buildings as well. So all this stuff was happening simultaneously, but still it wasn't enough. So we have this building here as a corner, as a cafe, this area had to get sited. You can, you, I don't, you probably can't see it, but in, in, in a photo here where the pipe is, there's actually a, a rat head uh, sticking out of it um, um, at the time as well. When I, when I took this photo, I was actually very surprised. But then I also thought about this too, and, and when I was going around the area is that when uh, dogs and humans uh, urinate on metal, they cause corrosion and then the, the rodents are able to infiltrate the spaces a lot easier. So as I said, we, we took all these efforts and measures, but it still wasn't enough. The project, the uh, abatement was starting to get frustrated, but we, we had a, a new hope of light. Um, we had a, a special uh, visit from uh, rural renowned rodentologist uh, Bobby Corrigan actually uh, uh, came to our came to our site. Um, my colleague uh, Al Holm actually reached out to him, and he was in that he was in the Bay Area at the time doing his rodent academy. So he came down to San Francisco. We had lunch, and he actually uh, assessed our area. Um, we don't have photos of that because. We didn't want to fan out at the time. So uh, I wish we would have got a photo because that would have been a, a very uh, historical uh, moment for to, to add to our slide deck um, for any future presentations, but we weren't thinking about it at the time. So when uh, Dr. Corrigan came down, he said, he looked at he looked at the platforms and and he assessed it. We went down in the Bart Tunnel. He said, actually, in order to abate this issue, you would have to do abate abatement on an eight block radius, and that kind of threw us for a tailspin. And we knew that we didn't have the resources to do that. But what he also said is that we can uh, remove the platform, which should help. So. We, we spoke back to our, our team of stakeholders and professionals and told them that we would have to get the platform removed. The platform was removed and then we had direct access to the burrows. The, the, um, the rodents were actually um, under the trees uh, in the, in the, plat, in the, um, in the plat, underneath the platforms. They have uh, trees in there as well. So some of the issues that were happening in the area where we had dumpsters, uh, public health site at this area. Some of the things I talked about, we had cracks and crevices that need to be treated. There's also a fountain where some sanitation things had built up. So we had our uh, public works team uh, take care of this as well. Uh, we had to get our stationary engineers down here to handle um, some of this work as well. So they cleaned out these gated areas and then we have trash in some of the uh, uh, manholes uh, that um, that are connected to the waterfall, and um, we got those areas cleaned out as well. Uh, this is what the area looked like um, uh, before we removed the platform. It was grass. There was um, some missing uh, missing um, missing grates for some of the water drainage areas, uh, and then some of our cracks and crevices. Uh, were there at, at the same time. So a lot of this stuff was just a lot of deferred maintenance that didn't happen. So uh, the great thing about this project is that we had full um, cooperation because everybody that was involved understood how much of a public health hazard this was. So after we got the, the deck, the platforms removed, uh, we did some research and came up with a plan. Um, First, before we uh, before we did the renovation, we actually had to do direct burrow um, abatement. And and what we chose to to get the most bang for our buck is that we did the gas cartridges right underneath the um, under the trees uh, where the burrows were. We had to do that for about two weeks. And after we did that uh, level of abatement, we had zero rats in the area. So we went from having hundreds of rats in about a two weeks time, we had no rats. So in order to prevent this from happening again, then we came up with a plan to, um, to do a renovation project. 
So the, the soil level was below grade. So that worked out in our favor. Then we added uh, a layer of um, a base gravel because the reason why we added the base gravel because we felt it would be a, something that it would, the rodents, um, would, it would be hard for the rodents to dig through. Uh, so, and then after that, we put in another layer of real reinforcement. We put the excluder, excluder geo uh, fabric down. And then on top of that, we put a layer of DG just, just for security reasons. We didn't want these rodents to come back. Um, so so after, after we did all this stuff here, some of the crews doing the work, they put down the, the geo fabric, which, which was, it was most definitely time consuming, uh, but at the end of the day, it was, it was uh, worth, worth doing it like this, um, just, so, uh, just, so we, um, just so we can have some, some type of control measures in place. They're putting the fabric in, putting the edging on. And then after that, here's, what it looked like at the time. This is the decomposed granite. On top of that, all this stuff got leveled out at the end of the project. Um, and here are some of the cracks that got sealed. And one thing I forgot to mention as well is that we actually had to get the uh, some of the, the trash cans removed and replaced to get some of these uh, rodent, rodent proof uh, trash cans in the area as well. But we had a lot of stakeholders, um, a lot of stakeholder participation. Without that, we would not have been successful uh, with this project. Uh, we had, you know, like I said, we had our building repair shop out there. Everyone set this as a priority. We even had help while we were doing trapping uh, when we first started the project uh, for safety reasons to make sure that people didn't touch the traps. We had to, you know, cone off whole areas, and we had a lot of uh, human power to uh, to eradicate this issue. Um, and 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 you know, it, it's important for us to be able to um, to communicate with uh, everyone we need to, and and have good working relationships. And that's something that I most definitely like about being a part of the citywide um, San Francisco citywide IPM team is that those contacts are already um, in place before we do big projects like this and we know who the stakeholders are and we've already built relationships with them. So some of the takeaways that I got um, from this project, especially after talking, talking to Dr. Bobby Corrigan was to see the big picture, um, understand the whole area um, before doing a, a design project so that you can actually prevent uh, pests from coming, uh, whether that's uh, pedestrian foot traffic, if there's uh, dogs in the area, if there's already if there's already a pre-existing uh, pest issue that needs to um, that needs to happen, um, just take all those things into consideration and know who the stakeholders are in the area as well, and understand the use of the area. An area like UN Plaza is used 24 hours a day, so it's extremely important for us to. Um, to figure out uh, different ways to um, mitigate some of these issues because we got a lot of people coming in from San Francisco and the first thing they see is a whole bunch of rats running around in the daytime. No, nobody wants to nobody wants to see that or they don't want that to be their memory when they go on uh, vacation to to a to a place like uh, to a beautiful city like San Francisco. So those are some of the takeaways. And then I also want to give shots out to some of the folks that helped out, which is SFMTA, BART. Pest Tech did their work in the um, in the BART tunnel, and then we had uh, we also had um, the Department of Public Health inspectors came out, which was uh, Natash Tar uh, from uh, Public Health. He did some of the siding for us, and all of our teams at at Public Works pitched in. Uh, we had our building repair, we had our street the uh, the team that does our street cleaning and we also had the landscape team and our cement shop helped out with this project as well and of course uh, public uh, uh, department of uh, department of the environment helped out as well Chris uh, was most definitely on board and gave us some good ideas and strategies to get this project done and um thank you for having me that uh most definitely concludes uh, my portion of the project thank you. Thank you, Nikki. That is really, truly one of the most impressive prevention um, projects that I've ever heard of as well. Um, 
and now uh, to give you a different perspective on uh, prevention um, by design, we have Daniel Levy. Daniel Levy has been working almost 20 years with the Gardeners Guild, a landscaping company in the Bay Area. Um, he was a very active member as well of the working group for this guide. And uh, thanks to his many years of experience in the landscaping profession, um, he, was help, he was able to help ground truth um, to many of the ideas being discussed. And today he'll be talking to you about clothing and feeding the soil through cover crops. <laughs> Daniel, take it away. I'm gonna just share my slides. Hello. So, um, <clears throat> I come from a, um, for the purposes of this presentation, <laughs> I come from a background of, of um, landscape contracting um, and in the realm of management as opposed to construction. Um, but landscape management involves all of the aspects of, of um, that are covered in the guide. And um, I, I want to say that I'm, I'm very happy that um, Chris mentioned that the first chapter uh, might come as an unexpected surprise, um, the notion of um, designing with maintenance in mind. But it's really, really critical. Um, you saw that even in Nikki's presentation that the redesign was very important, both for users and for precluding um, pests. And so I wanna start just with something before I, I talk about a sort of a odd, perhaps odd or radical idea in landscape design, notion of, of cover cropping or a corollary to it. I wanna show you a few slides about how when we don't design properly and we don't collaborate with maintenance people, management people on what the design's gonna turn out to be, we get something like this slide. You might see that pen with the red cap, which is six inches long, indicating that the spot that this shrub is planted in is less than two feet wide. Now this is a plant that wants to be, you know, easily six or eight feet wide and eight or 12 feet tall. It's under a window in a narrow spot by a, by a, 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 um, um, a disabled ramp, an access ramp, and it's covering the railing. So in effect, as this plant matured, it has become the pest. It creates a barrier for people who have handicaps and need access. Um, it creates building issues and a pest reservoir on the back where there's no clearance between the plant and the building. And um, this is just a, a, an example of uh, absolutely you know, poor design. In the next slide, we can see um, we can see the same shrub. Uh, where again, it's, it's in front of windows, it's sandwiched between another plant. And this area, in fact, had the building tolerated the screen, had the windows um, tolerated screening, the plant actually is in a bed that's, that's wide enough to facilitate it to be growing and pruned in a natural manner. Um, but because something else was stuck in there, um, you know, again, it's just, an, it's just an impossible design. And what the result of this is, so the plant becomes the pest, um, you know, is, is, it's just all too common a scenario in, in commercial landscape design and to a degree in residential design. And I'm not pointing a finger at anybody who's a designer out there um, and who might be with us today. Um, I'm just kind of pointing this out as facts in the field, um, things we want to avoid. And, just kind of to go back for a moment to some of the that holistic approach that that Rescape and Bay Friendly brings to the table and that Teresa kind of iterated earlier. So what happens now? This plant is here and it's going to remain here. And what we have to do to keep it there is shear it with great frequency. Shearing with great frequency means that we've got noise and exhaust emissions. We've got physical 
taxing labor that's totally unnecessary for the employees who are doing the work. And by the way, labor that's not very interesting. And the last thing is we're generating a bunch of, of um, green material that ne then needs to be taken, depending on where you live in the country, either to landfill or to a recycle facility. And in the recycle facility, there's a bunch of embedded energy in taking it there, recycling it into a landscape product, bagging it up or selling it in bulk to go back and be reapplied to the landscape. It's just kind of an insane cycle. We'll go through the next couple slides real quickly, but um, if we move on to the next example, here's another shrub that at first glance looks like, oh, look, it's got new leaf color, it's flowering, it's quite attractive. If you flip to the next slide where you see the end of the hedge, all of that nice new growth and flowers, they're just, the, whoever the contractor here is just late in shearing it off to keep it bounded in this narrow planter bed. And we see that underneath, what we have is a severely stressed, very unhealthy plant. So it's struggling to live under impossible conditions because it's, you know, it's a very big square peg in a very tiny round hole. Um, let's look at the last example of this sort of thing. Here again is an example of the shrub that we're looking at principally underneath those flowering trees is Abelia uh, grandiflora. It's a very nice shrub. It's almost never seen in a way that it gives us its glory. By the way, I'm gonna mention it with this, but going back to the other two plants, with the example of that Escalonia, we're constantly shearing it. Escalonia flowers on the ends of new growth. And when it's allowed to grow in a natural form, it's flowering through a, a long flowering season, providing pollen to a lot of pollinators, as well as the beauty of the flowering. We don't see any of that because we're shearing it off. The other thing we're doing when we shear all that stuff off is we're creating lots of new growth spurts. And as many of you know, new growth spurts of fleshy succulent growth is a recipe for aphids and other sucking insects. So we're creating an actual uh, insect, potential insect and disease pest problem by constantly stressing the plants. And so back to this last example here, once again, if we look, oh, no, no, we're, we're still, uh, I mean, the last example we're talking about. So with the abelia, if we flip to the next slide, you can see that this plant is being sheared, but it's in an area with a useless lawn where actually, let's look at the, at the next slide, um, that's, that area is about 10 feet wide. So this shrub, actually could be growing in this space if there weren't a lawn there um, and it weren't being sheared for some unknown reason, I guess force of habit. Um, it could be allowed to have flowing sprays of branches that are arching, that flower all along their length from new little bits of growth. And instead, it's something that's just being constantly sheared um, and, and it, it, it gives us almost no benefit um, and just is creating a tremendous amount of work. And again, we're stressing a plant that ultimately um, leads to pest infestation of that particular plant. So the, the, the point of this is that when, when you go through the manual and you look at maintenance plan development, it's really important, first of all, to have all of the elements that are mentioned there um, because, um, and then this ties to our next thing, which is planting and design. But it's important to have those elements in there because one of the, one of the tactics of, of shearing plants is because it's something that's fast and doesn't require a lot of skill level. But a more thoughtfully designed landscape um, would allow for plants to maintain a natural form provide both a useful and educational function um, in, a, in a public landscape um, and require a totally different, a different kind of work. Um, we're gonna move on from there um, to, um, to cover cropping. And 
here I'm going to give a little interlude. Um, <laughs> sort of where we are in the landscape. So in a way, we're all gardeners, whether we are actively gardeners or whether we're gardeners by default. And what I mean is kind of going back to points that have been raised by everyone who spoke here today and, and on Monday, in that everything in our environment in the complicated ecologies of this planet are interlinked. We know that, we know that without a doubt. Um, we learned it by having big brains, um, opposable thumbs, and being absolutely totally, totally boneheaded for, for generations. Uh, but we're people and we learned. And um, <clears throat> so we, we're all gardeners, whether we are gardeners by default or gardeners by intention. And for me as a gardener, I approach everything, I try to approach everything from uh, this ecosystem perspective that's been being talked about. And what that means is that we'll, we'll prevent pests by having health and resilience. And we'll have health and resilience by having healthy soil and by having a diverse palette of plants because plants we are learning, this is even scientifical, you can read about this in, in bona fide sort, uh, resources, that um, plants speak to each other and they take care of each other much the way people and other animals take care of each other. Plants are far more social than we know. So with that said, I wanna, I wanna jump to this other sort of, what might have seen, seem, seemed an arcane, not landscape related topic, but in our holistic universe, they're, they're actually, in our holistic way of looking at things, it's actually quite pertinent. So in agriculture, in regenerative um, biological agricultural systems, um, agricultural ecologies, there's a concept called cover cropping. So a field, even a fallow field, fallow from producing um, a, a crop that's gonna be uh, marketed somehow, uh, the earth needs to be covered and the earth needs to have things that were cropped out of it um, in growing things regenerated. And that's done by this principle of cover cropping. And a cover crop can be either a uh, grain or cereal crop, which is mostly for biomass, a lot of carbon and some other nutrition, um, or it can be uh, um, a legume, which is a nitrogen fixing plant, um, and that replenishes the soil in yet another way. But the interesting thing about cover crops, they're not just for nutrition, they're for habitat. So, and, and they're not just for habitat. So they're habitat in that they harbor many, many beneficial insects um, and support other beneficial organisms. Um, and they also prevent erosion. They smother or outcompete weeds. Um, and the other thing about plants is a plant, we see the above ground part and we often don't talk about the roots. A lot of the work of what's happening in the soil is being done by those roots. Those roots are going into the soil and opening up pore space. They're channeling water down into the soil. They're holding water because they're as living organisms or living plant, part, plant parts, they hold that water. They provide uh, habitat and exudates, which are food for soil microorganisms. Um, and of course they sequester carbon and do other things. The other thing, so the other thing those plant roots and those plants do is they mine nutrients out of the soil for their own nutrition and then render them available to other plants. So, so these cover crops are very, very active in enlivening and improving the soil. And the beautiful thing about it is that this is nature and the cycle doing all of the work for us. 
we need to use the gray matter to select the appropriate cover crops. And there's a little bit of work and generally it's pretty labor not intensive to apply cover crops. Um, and then at the end of the crop, there's a variety of ways that those crops are laid down to be reincorporated into the soil. So they can be plowed in, but they can also be in the case of certain crops um, and the ones that I think will as gardeners find most friendly. Um, they don't create a weed problem because generally these are annual crops that are grown either for cold season or warm season, depending on what, mo mo what most suits them. And at the end of their lifespan, and this needs to be timed according to how the plant's gonna give back. Sometimes we let them flower, sometimes we let them set seed, um, sometimes it's just before both of those, but, but we're not gonna go into those fine details today. The point is at the end of their growing cycle, they may be mown down and left to lay and decompose uh, where they provide a mulch layer um, and then are decomposed by a combination of what's on top and soil microorganisms and macroorganisms, worms drag them down, for example. Um, or they may be, so they may be mowed and laid down. They may be rolled um, and laid down um, and then put to bed that way. And in some cases, um, as a green manure, they're actually cultivated or turned into the soil. So, um, so that's cover cropping in agriculture. And you might think, well, how can we do that in a landscape? And there are two principal ways that that can be done. One is with the right constellation of things and a lot of pre-planning in larger landscapes, a cover crop can be grown and applied before anything is done with the soil in terms of all the other work that's coming along with the possible exception of, um, it'd probably be good to have the sprinkler system in at a time, unless you're doing it as a winter cover crop. So we apply this seasonal crop and then we knock it down and then we begin the, begin the process of you know, laying out plants, planting and all that. The one caveat about cover cropping previous and also in, an, in, in a, as part of a growing landscape, is it kind of requires a sprinkler irrigation system, overhead irrigation, as opposed to drip. For obvious reasons, we're sprouting seeds um, and then we're managing their growth um, over a short season. Um, and that can't really be done effectively with drip um, in most cases. Some of this you may be able to tell that I'm thinking on the fly um, because the notion of using a gridded drip system that provides water to the entire soil surface um, would allow pr probably for sprouting something like this. But if we have to mow or roll it down, then we're gonna have complications with our drip system. So sprinklers are the, are the way to go. They're the way to go anyway, no matter what tells you, what anybody tells you about drip, sprinklers are the way to go. Um, that's another topic for another day. So, so all these, these cover crops and combinations um, how do, we, how do we try to incorporate that in the landscape? Let's see what the next slide is, because I can't remember. This is yarrow that we're looking at. Oh, so here you may be able to see in this very poor resolution and poor picture, there's a, there's a pear tree and in front of the pear tree is a winter cover crop, a total volunteer winter cover crop that's actually um, a combination of annuals and perennials. There are grasses and there are wild radish. This was taken two weeks ago, um, since then, all of that's been mown down, and this is not a high-profile landscape where, where you can't leave uh, chaff to dry out. And it's drying out under the tree, and it's a very low-key, very low-energy um, cover crop um, because what's under the tree um, is going to provide the summer mulch, and it doesn't compete for winter rain when the, when the tree is dormant. Um, the next slide might show us what we're looking at. So there's a little picture, sorry, it's so small, of a plant called buckwheat. And let's see the next slide real quickly, which is the buckwheat flowering. The beautiful thing about buckwheat and why we can use it, it's a, it's a real killer um, uh, um, cover crop in agricultural systems. Um, I think I'm probably running out of time, so we're gonna speed this up here, is that it grows, it sprouts, grows, flowers and can be knocked down in about 40 days. If you have an entire growing season, warm growing season, because it'll be killed by cold, 
you could double or triple crop this to create layers of um, all of the things it brings to the soil and then um, the, the uh, biomass of it before you ever did your fall planting on that site. Let's skip ahead to another plant. Um, this is alyssum. You're all familiar with alyssum. Um, it's used in pots, it's used in bowls, it's used in big planters, and it's used in planting beds. Alyssum is also used in farm cropping systems because those little flowers, whether you know it or not, are a really wonderful host, um, an alternate host for tons of beneficial insects. Lots of parasitic wasps, lady beetles, and many others will alternately host, uh, will alternately feed on the pollen. And um, it's, an, it's a, an annual that in our area can be grown almost year round, seeded and grown almost year round, but you can just mow it down and then it's gone. It, it'll come back from seed um, in places, but it's very easily controlled, doesn't become a total pest problem. So now let's skip ahead. Um, so those two kinds of plants can be used. Here is um, alyssum being used as a cover crop just in a planter barrel. And so it provides the, um, the, the weed control in that barrel, as well as brings additional beneficials into the, into the garden when other things aren't flowering. Um, and it grows a longer season than the windows for the pests. Next slide, please. Um, so here it's being grown in a nursery situation. It's gonna go into the ground when that nurse plant, when that fig gets planted, it's going in with live plants or seeds or both. And so that cover crop is going right out into the little home orchard with that plant. Next slide. That's just a top view in case you couldn't see it. Next slide. Um, so the other approach that we can take, so, so all of that was to say that if you have a wide spacing, I forget what number that is in chapter three, but wide spacing between plants, so you, you, you're not wasting a lot of uh, resource on plants that aren't gonna be, but we got a lot of space to fill and we wanna control weeds. It can be done with mulching, it can be done with living mulching. So with the right plant palette, you could sow either of those two plants and have a lovely cover uh, among your larger permanent plants and mow that out and, and crop that through the year. The other approach is this approach. Um, take a look at this slide and then the next slide and then the following slide. And there are many short-lived perennials. We won't talk about that because we're kind of out of time. There are many short-lived perennials that you can grow in between widely spaced woody shrubs and trees that are gonna mature over time. And these things will start to peter out after two or three or five years. But in the meantime, they fill in quickly, provide lots of interest and habitat, and they are living mulches that don't need to be replaced and replenished like wood chips or other kinds of things. So we can interplant with short-lived plants that fill in quickly. Um, and then we've got a really dynamic design kind of like this is a dynamic document. And with that, I will close so that we can move to the questions um, and, uh, and commentary section. Thanks. Am I supposed to do something to indicate further that I'm done or was that it? <laughs> no, I apologize. Sorry, I'm having a little bit of a, a challenge transitioning back. <laughs> Sorry about that. Thank you so much. That was beautiful. Oop, that was beautiful, Daniel. Um, I would like to uh, quickly bring us to a few calls to action um, that we do have in mind regarding this uh, this document. Um, let me pull them up quickly. Oop. And then we will take your your questions immediately after. Um, So um, at the end of all this, what we really, really want you to take away is, uh, in addition to all these wonderful um, stories and illustrations of how uh, designing for pest prevention is, is really important, um, you know, we can't get very far if nobody really knows about this guide, this, these guidelines. So we would love for you to um, bookmark them in your browser, um, share them with colleagues and friends. Um, I'm putting, I, I, put the website on this slide, but also in the comment section. And then um, participate. 
as Chris and as uh, our presenters have mentioned, um, this is a living guide and we really would love for it to continue to grow and develop um, as people share their experiences and, uh, and give us feedback as to how to improve um, what's already in there. So we've created a little bit.ly link that's at the bottom of the slide. I'll share that in an email as well. Um, note that it is uh, cap sensitive. So if it's a uh, capital letter in that bit.ly link, you need to actually put it in this capital letter, um, just a side note. Um, but yeah, thank you so much everyone for, for participating and we would love to hear questions for the presenters. Do we have any in the chat? Let's see. Not I did, any, I'm not I seeing not any right see now. any in the chat. Okay. But while we're waiting for that, I have a question. Go for it. <laughs> and thank you so much to both uh, Nikki and Daniel. Those are those are great stories. They're very diverse. <laughs> they're very different stories, but very apropos to this. Um, uh, Nikki, I'm going to put you on the spot. You made you really made, painted the picture very clearly about how bad the problem was before your renovation, but you didn't tell the story about the boss rat. <laughs> Can you tell the, the boss rat story? Well, Chris, I, I think that the boss rat is still there, but um, the boss rat was most definitely running the show. Uh, we we had a couple of encounters where uh, we had a rat or or two that was so big that they couldn't fit in the trap that they would actually take the trap off, um, trap off their heads, and then there was a. Uh, a rat down in the BART station that was running the show was actually communicating with the other rats when we were out there as well. We saw that in action. So it's, it's been a few times where in... I've actually, say it. Go, go ahead, go ahead. No, there's been a, a few times where I've actually seen um, Norway rats uh, communicate with each other when I am in their presence. <laughs> whether it's the the mother rat talking to the kids to get out the way or or uh the boss rat or the main rat telling the other rats to get out the way as well so there were some very well fed rats out there in the oh Empire yeah the most way. definitely and uh nikki do they make eye contact with you while they're talking to each other just like no, stare no <laughs> nah, no no stare downs <laughs> I actually have a quick question for you too. Um, and I'm not sure if you mentioned this, but how long did that project take? There are mm -hmm. so many steps, you know, from oh. start to finish, so many par partners that you worked with. It's a huge project. I would say the project, the project was a, probably about three month span, a, a three month span project. People were moving to, to for for uh, things that happen in a in a public agency type setting this project moved yeah. along pretty quickly yeah <laughs> and and so i had a question as well which is and, and you might have said this and i might have missed it but but how long ago was that project completed so like how how long are you now into your new sort of maintenance relatively rat free um the project took place in 2019 okay. and we still are are rat free in the area at this time that is really amazing yeah. I, I don't know if, who else is on this um, webinar and looking at that, but as somebody who's been in, in landscape and in pest control for 40 years, that the, ma the magnitude of that project is like really, really beyond um, like my, my comprehension. It's really amazing. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, I mean, the, the good thing is that, like I said in the presentation, that a lot of those relationships were already formed. So it just it just made the project a lot easier to um, to do, most definitely. A lot of support. There out was there. one point there was one point, Nikki, I remember when we had about like five or six different departments standing out there on a very cold day in UN Plaza um, plotting a plotting a strategy, which is on short notice that was that's pretty unusual in the city family to be able to pull together people that quickly yeah and do uh and and working together so that was terrific and uh you know i had a little question for you daniel um uh we, we talked about uh, you know the need for considering maintenance in planning these uh these landscapes quite a lot in the, the working groups but i wonder if you have you worked and uh, have you had contracts or situations where they really did a maintenance audit, like where they did that in a purposeful way 
and where you could see the mm -hmm. results? Um, it, it, in, in the planning stage, you mean? Yeah, yeah, before they put in a landscape, they actually talked to the people doing the maintenance or did something more formal, you know, it could yeah. be any form you think of. Um, no, my, my, my experience with that, with those situations, uh, they don't come up that often. Um, what, I, what I have found is um, with some of our longer term clients, we've had large projects where they asked us to review plans that were done by an architect and not done by us. Um, and, you know, at that point, there are a lot of things that, uh, there are things that can be changed and done, but there are a lot of things that aren't gonna be redone. Cause when there's a full set of plans for everything, you know, grading, civil, all of various layers, there's, there's not a lot that's gonna be changed. It might, there might be some irrigation changes made. There might be some plant palette changes. And I'm always really grateful when at least that happens. Um, when, the, when we get to have some feedback, um, even though it's not always listened to, um, it's at least nice to be able to come back and say, well, you know, we're two years into this and huh, fancy that, just like we said, um, but we're very polite about it. I have a question. Hey. My name is Donald. Go for it, Donald. Hi. Uh, so I work for UC Berkeley. Uh, I'm with the IPM team. Also, I help with the landscaping, uh, weed abatement. So I'm spraying, I'm applying pre emergent granules. Uh, we have a tremendous problem with weeds growing through the mulch. I mean, we've mulched a lot of areas. I'm talking about areas that are half acre, quarter acre, you know, very large areas. Uh, however, uh, some of these areas need to be irrigated because you do have plants and some, I mean, it's just virtually no uh, vegetation. It's just, just uh, mulch, but they still have irrigation systems. Uh, but what's the best and they use cardboard for uh, weed barrier before they put down the mulch. What's the best way to prevent uh, weeds from coming back up through the mulch, even though you still have plants in the uh, same mulched area or in the fringe of the mulch there? <laughs> That's actually a very big question. <laughs> <laughs> and Part of the answer has to do with, and you will find this always in any kind of pest management and pest control, what weeds do you have? Because it really depends if there are just annual weed species, which can be very, I, I won't say very easily, but can be maintained without poisons, without any problem. Uh, it's a matter of a strategy and a result. And if you have, um, very pernicious perennial weeds, it's a different issue. So the first thing is identifying what weeds are we talking about. The next thing, just from your description, is taking a look at the irrigation system and the existing plants that are intended to be irrigated. And are we over irrigating and irrigating into open areas that can we can pull that water back um, to discourage you know, weed growth? So those are the two kind of immediate questions that require answering. And I don't know if you can answer those here, um, but um, I would certainly be happy uh, either myself or someone from, from the guild to be in contact with you about, you know, kind of evaluating what your problem is and then how to deal with it. I do have a uh, <laughs> 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 <Okay. laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? I mean, Nikki, did you want to chime in on that question? Do you have any, or on the other question about maintenance audits? Did you have any? Um, you want to, throw uh, to speak on the, the weed issue, I, I, I just want to uh, kind of piggyback on, on, on what Daniel said. It's all about the strategy and it's all about time. It's all about how much time and effort you're actually going to put into it and understanding the, the weed species as well, because a lot of people don't focus on the seed bank 
of wheat species, and that's very important to understand what you are working with. Hey, Chris, to go, to go back to your question, actually, one, one thing I want to say, though, is that we do on existing landscapes is when we go on a new site, at least I do, I know what, I, what I've done for 20 years, is I write a pretty exhaustive assessment of where the landscape is, is when we get there. So general plant health, suitability of species, what the irrigation system looks like and how it functions, you know, weed issues if they are, drainage issues if they can be noted. And, and um, you know, this, this is like, uh, you know, uh, somewhere in the guideline, it talks about creating an, an, an IPM uh, record keeping system and a database. And you need that for every site to be able to manage because, you know, you can't manage what you don't know is there. So we start out with that. And it would be better, of course, to have had that conversation before the landscape was ever built and do what we're talking about, which is work a lot of those problems out before they ever have the, the, the possibility of happening. But in lieu of that, to go in and then do this assessment on existing sites and then try to think about short, medium, long range planning for uh, sort of converting, you know, or having the landscape evolve, and then also be able to deal with pest issues that as they as they arrive, um, it's it's really important. So. Terrific! That's that's great. Thank you. And I, I do see we're out of time, um, but if uh, you know, I'm sure if you have any other, if anyone has any other questions, um, send by, by email. We're happy to field them. And um, Jen, did you have some closing remarks there? Yeah, I wanted to thank everybody for joining us again, particularly the presenters and all the hard work that you put into making this guide. Um, I will be sending out a follow up email with Teresa uh, to remind you of the action items to give you the links um, that we talked about during the presentation, and to give you also contact information if you're interested in reaching out to the presenters. Um, and with that, thank you so very much to to Daniel to Nikki to Teresa to Chris um, for for being with us and presenting about this guidelines. Thank you. And to Jen for moderating. Thank you all. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, everybody. You. That was awesome. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Bye. -bye. You too. Bye. Bye. Bye.